every intelligent Jewish kid was in India or China or Tibet at practicing Buddhism. Wow. All of a sudden, they start trickling back. And many of them came to our program in Minnesota. Why did they come back? Their guru told them to. Mm. And they said, you see, they're so open-minded, they're not trying to brainwash you. But one of them, who had become literally the right-hand man of the Dalai Lama. Wow. Because she was brilliant. The Dalai Lama told her to go back to her tradition. Why? You see, if you practice Buddhism and you train yourself to meditate, you eventually climb the ladder of, of enlightenment mm. until you reach a level of bliss where everything is just wonderful. Mm. Jews did it in warp speed. Mm. Every Jewish kid got there, got the meditation down, did the whole thing. They were devoted. They, and they get to the highest level of bliss and they're feeling wonderful. And they come to the Dalai Lama and say, okay, what can we do now? He said, no, now, no. That's it. You, no, you don't That's have it. to do anything. You're happy. And they said, yes, so let's do something. Wow. Said, Get out of here. You don't belong here. Wow. You're going to mess up our whole religion. Huh? <laughs> Go back to Judaism. Yeah. Because it's true. If we can reach the state of total bliss, we would become so active and so ambitious so funny. Wow. Why? Because if I can relax me, I become so conscious of God and what he needs and what he wants that I will devote myself completely mm. to him. So bliss is not an end. It's a tool. Mm. We should all be blissful so that we can stop worrying about ourselves and do what we were born to do, and that is make God's plan work for Him. Because that ultimately serves us. It doesn't have to. But it does, doesn't it? Yes. It doesn't have to. And that's the next level, right? So if we cannot be thinking about how it serves us, that's the next level. That's, that's the bliss part. That's the bliss part. <laughs> But, but even getting to the point where we are doing to serve is what actually evolves us to the place where we need to evolve to. Because we want desperately to be more than human. Mm. Not the best human. Uh, so when, when non-Jews say, you think you're better humans, you're more, you know, you're superior, no. You be human and be happy. We'll never be happy being. So it's a different agenda. It's a different thing. Wow. Wow. What do you think of uh, past lives? Mm. You got into that? <laughs> That's my favorite topic. <laughs> That's my talk. favorite topic. And it's, 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 it's a little bit... Um, it's a topic that is controversial because, one, most people's knowledge of past lives is Brian Weiss's many lives, many masters. And that is not surprisingly, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it, it diverges far from Torah concepts. And the little bit that I have studied has added so much color and meaning to my life that I would love to go there. I would love to go there. So just a few, I'm just going to put, you know, sort of speak to a few of the things that I know for sure. Um, or, or please correct me if I'm wrong. One of the things I know for sure is that we are the same gender for the most part through every life that we have. If we come back as a different gender, generally there's a glitch in the process of being reborn for a certain specific reason that we need to learn. 
The second thing that I know is that we have, we don't have a multitude of hundreds of lives like Buddhists believe and like others believe, but we have maybe a handful, give or take, and that really, really adds uh, a, a tremendous amount of purpose to each life we're living because when I used to think that we, we've had hundreds of lives, then for me, it was like, well, what's the point? Well, let's just live it up this one, and then we can come back in the next one, and we can, you know, try harder then. But then it's, it's, it adds purpose. You, you really want to try to get it right this time. Um, and then there were the different layers of what happens once you move on as a soul that was very interesting to me. Whether it was the, um, what happens, uh, I don't, I don't want to say the terminology because maybe it's a little bit like the beating in the grave, which is kind of the first stages of that. It's like carpet cleaning where you beat the carpet and get all the stuff out. But all of that was very interesting for me too because there was such a rhyme and reason to the evolution of the soul that that too for me, added meaning to while we're here. So any aspect of that that you'd like to speak to, I'd, I'd love to hear. Yeah, in, in Buddhism, being reincarnated is an automatic process, and you have to do something to stop it. Otherwise, you'll just keep coming back and cycling You'll come back as a human, you'll come back as an animal, you'll come back as a vegetable, go through it again and again and again. Right. right. <clears throat> you come back only because you have more to accomplish that you didn't finish in one lifetime, so you're given another chance. There are mitzvahs that only women do, there are mitzvahs that only men do. At least once, every soul has to be a woman. Mm, really? <gasps> wow. That I didn't know, Rabbi. So some, somebody asked me, wouldn't you like to be a woman? I said, done that. <laughs> <laughs> Been there. Wow. Wow. So that way you get to do all 613 minutes. Wow. wow. Uh, <clears throat> but you don't just automatically come back. There's a, there's a court in heaven, and the court assesses how much you accomplished, how much you were supposed to accomplish, whether you can accomplish it if you're given another chance. And if yes, then you come back and you finish your job. Wow. So even great holy souls come back, because there's more they can do. So it's not a punishment. Now, ultimately... Every body, every physical body that performed mitzvahs, with the soul, of course, deserves 80% of the reward. Because every mitzvah you can think of, it's the body that's doing it. Oh, wow. You know, a soul can't eat matzah on Pesach. Hmm. Only the body can do that. A soul can't light Shabbos candles. Mm. It certainly can't go to the mikvah. Mm. So it's the body that should get the bulk of the reward. Mm. And yet we're told that when you die, your soul goes to heaven and it gets rewarded. And your body? Eh, put it away. No. You preserve the body because the soul is coming back to that body. Because that body is going to get its reward. Wow. So yes, it decomposes, but that's temporary. So the soul never really loses its affection to its body. And that's why if you go to Israel, for example, what is what is one of the uh, one of the most favorite and, and and uh, popular sites. Yeah. 
Hebron, where our ancestors, our matriarchs and patriarchs, are buried. You know how long they've been buried? And you go into where their bodies are? Come on. The bodies are gone. And no, they're not. Wow. And if you want to get to the soul, the soul hangs around its body forever. It will never give up on its body. Wow. So that is called resurrection. So if I have been here three times, I have had three different lives, means I have three different bodies. I want them all. And they all deserve to be rewarded. Hmm. When will they be rewarded? When after Mashiach comes, all the bodies will get back out of their graves, have their souls back, and then be rewarded appropriately. That's why we are so careful with the body. So what is Chibut HaKever? The beating of the, of the grave? The soul grieves every time another part of the body decomposes. Wow. It's not the body that's suffering. Right. But the soul watching the body go, painful. Mm. It's been done many times when they dug up the body of a very holy person. Hundred years later, no decomposition. No. <laughs> wow. But just like a body can decompose, it can also recompose. Mm. That's called resurrection of the dead. Wow. These bones will live again. So, the, the, the conviction that we've always had and never questioned. Life is short, right? How, how often have you heard, life is short, life is fragile. Before you know it, it's gone. Be careful, don't waste time. That's morbid. Is, and it's not true. Life is forever, death is temporary. Hmm. When the soul leaves the body, it does not change its character. So here's a very important distinction between Judaism and Christianity. Christianity says if you make it to heaven, you will be an angel. All angels are the same. You've seen one, you've seen them all. <laughs> right? You're an angel. Right. You look like every other angel, you feel like every other angel. When your soul leaves the body, it does not change its personality. So if your father was a rigid person with no sense of humor, don't make jokes about him even now. He has no sense of humor. Mm. Wow. If he was a jolly, funny guy, live it up. Mm. Because he's still that way. Which wow. is even more significant. God forbid a child dies. That soul, let's say a six-year-old, that soul is six years old. Forever? Until it comes back. A six-year-old needs its mother. Mm. If you stop being its mother, it hurts. Mm. So, it's not that you become a generic something. You remain yourself. And part of that is you remain enamored with your body. How does that work when, during the time of Moshiach, when all of your bodies are coming back, how does the soul inhabit multiple bodies? A soul can divide into many parts. The, the, soul, the body in which I succeeded, let's say, in kindness, the kindness of my soul will enter into that mm. body. In the other body, I succeeded in being more disciplined and more focused, well, then that part of my soul will go into that body. In fact, the part of the, the part of the soul that succeeded is not reincarnated. It doesn't get born again. 
only the part that is not finished. So if a person was really good and really productive and so on, the, the biggest part of his soul will stay in heaven and the little piece that is not yet finished will come back and have another life. Gotcha. Another crack at it. Are you guys ready for a little bit of mind-bending stuff? Like, can we, is, is this, are you enjoying this? Like, this kind of complicated? We will, we will. But I, I want to ask a question that, like, I, don't, I, I agree with you on everything that you've said in terms of superheroes and stuff, but there's one thing that I feel like some of these movies, I, I feel like they, they display tenets, sometimes tenets of Kabbalah in certain ways that we couldn't possibly wrap our heads around. And the idea of a multiverse when I learned that not your, your whole soul does not reincarnate into your body, the parts that have accomplished their um, tikkun, their completion, stay up there. Occasionally they may come down to help you accomplish other things that you need to accomplish, but your entire soul is not reincarnated into everybody. Is there other, I mean, beyond the idea of our conception of heaven, are there other universes that our souls may be existing in, in other bodies? Or is that totally sci-fi and ridiculous? No, it's not. There are four worlds, and there are souls in each of the four worlds. Mm -hmm. They're very different from each other, more and more godly, spiritual. And they each have their their type of body, mm. obviously not a physical body. If it's not a physical body, it can't, it can't serve God. Ah, oh, wow. So the souls that are in heaven now are waiting impatiently to come back. Wow. Because as far as we're concerned, heaven is a very nice place, but it's like a retirement home. And we hate to be retired. Mm. Maybe for a month. Mm. A year. <laughs> Not forever. Right. So all the souls in heaven want to come back and serve God. Not be served. Mm. In heaven you are served. Wow. Okay. You want to get into some real Kabbalah? Literally? Yes, please. <laughs> when God creates the world, he creates it in a logical sequence, like a ladder, rung by rung, until, until the, the creation becomes solidified into a physical, finite, grubby, mundane object. That's so that we can follow the steps back. If he created it just with one fell swoop, there's no way to go back. So he creates it like a ladder so that we can climb the ladder. Each of these steps on the ladder is called a sphera, a divine attribute. Mm -hmm. Chesed, Gvura, Teferes, Netzach, Hod, Yisod, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Malchus. They're all focused downward. The Chachma faces the Bina, the Bina faces the Das, the Das faces the Chesed. Everything is in a downward, linear. When it comes to Malchus, the final of the ten attributes, it turns around and faces up. So that it receives everything that came before it, absorbs it all, then turns back and creates the next world. Wow. That's the attribute of royalty. Royalty is literally in the human, in the human, the country empowers an individual. The individual absorbs all of that and then turns around and runs the country. It's an interesting process. Wow. Very interesting. That's how democracy works. Mm. So democracy is much more godly 
because it mimics the way God created the world. So the beauty of it is that when God created Adam, not the first man, the first human, mm. because this Adam was male and female, mm -hmm. literally half male, half like two sides of a coin. Mm -hmm. One side was male, the other side was female. Siamese twins. Then we're told God separated them, turned them into two separate people, and immediately told them to get married and become one. They must have wondered. <laughs> we were one. You separate us and then tell us to become one? And also, how... Yeah, you can become one in a marriage. But that's kind of poetic. You're not literally one. Because you can walk away and... Right. So the oneness was much greater before he separated us. And now, yeah, we can achieve a oneness, but it won't be the oneness that we had. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we're losing ground. We're, we're getting worse, not better. So here is the romantic side of God and the romantic side of Kabbalah, which is Hasidut. Mm. The difference between the oneness that existed in creation and the oneness that we achieve through marriage. Adam and Eve were one body, inseparable but they'll never see each other because they're back to back. Mm. Wow. So they are in fact inseparable, but not face to face. Why? After se separating us, we will again become one through a good marriage, not as inseparable as before, but face to face. Mm. And that is much better, worth the operation and the recovery right so that we can be one face to face wow in other words god creates and things keep moving down eventually you get to malchus and malchus says wait a minute where am i coming from and turns around face to face mm. so intimacy begins in the last attributes the lowest attributes of each world. Amazing. So Yesod, which is called foundation, the fundamental relationship is male and female. Mm. It's the only attribute that comes in male and female. But it's back to back. They're inseparable. Right. But it's back to back. Wow. The next one, Malchus, turns around to face his creator. Wow. That's the feminine trait. Wow. Amazing. It's amazing. I mean, no human could come up with this stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's really, you know, this is the mind of God, and it's amazing. I'm, I'm, please go ahead, ask your question. You mentioned about, you know, how our parents, when they die, they're going to come back this, the same way they were before, right? So I lost my parents several years ago. I was extremely close to them, right? Um, in an, I always think about it daily basis, daily basis, right? So when they do come back, they're gonna come back the way they left, or they're gonna come. Or if they were not healthy, how would they come back? Would it be the same attitude as they were before? If they were funny before, they're gonna come back the same. And how would they come back? First of all, any body, a physical body, if it is born, then it is mortal. It'll die. The resurrection is not birth. 
when the body comes back through resurrection, it will never die again. It's forever. The body will come back exactly in the same shape in which it died, so that you'll recognize it. But then the process of healing will continue until the body is 20 years old. A child who died young, the healing will move it forward until it is 20 years old. Because Adam and Eve were created 20 That's years funny. old. That's the op optimal physical condition. Now, when everybody is 20 years old, that's going to be a party. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm really very much enjoying this discussion. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm learning a lot of things. I just want to know where the biblical source, where in the Jewish Bible are we getting all these concepts from? Torah is given in many layers, and that's why it's still alive, because every couple of hundred years, we discover another layer that re-excites us and re-inspires us, so that it's fresh and alive and, uh, and, and inspiring. So there is, of course, the written Torah. And there's the oral Torah, Torah Shabbat Peh. The Torah Shabbat Peh is mostly what God told Moshe, but didn't tell him to write it down. So, for example, Moshe comes down off the mountain after 40 days, and he says, men have to wear tefillin. They said, what's that? It doesn't describe it in the Torah. There's no description. So they said, to Moshe, <laughs> what does that mean? And Moshe described it in detail. It has to be made out of leather. It has to be square. It has to be with black paint, black straps. It has to sit on your head, and it has to sit on your arm. He knew it all. That's the oral Torah. So the oral Torah is God's word but not in written form. So there's a written Torah, there's the oral Torah, and there is the secret Torah. Moshe came down off the mountain and he taught Zohar, but he didn't write it down. So what is the Zohar? What was taught then, but now it was written down. Why wasn't it written down? Huh? Why wasn't it written down? Ah, why wasn't everything in Torah written down? Well, the practical reason? If everything was on paper, nobody would bother studying it. When I'll need it, I'll look it up. But because it was oral, it had to be remembered, it had to be memorized, so it had to be repeated, and every student had to be a genius. It made it a living not an archive. So it kept the interest alive. That's another interesting thing. We should maybe talk about it. At Mount Sinai, God said, gather the people and they will hear me talking. And the people said, well, why can't we see you? Let us see you. And God said, no. Listen. I think the reason that Judaism is still alive and we're still Jews and we're still practicing Torah is because we didn't see anything. If we had seen God, we, would not, we wouldn't be interested in him anymore. Because seeing kills passion. Contrary. But he tried, didn't he? He tried. And it just... 
dissipated everyone because we couldn't even handle. We couldn't handle hearing him. Is that is that what dissip? Is that oh wow? It wasn't even seeing him. It wasn't. It was a, oh wow. But the idea that if you see, you become more passionate. Like wow. men are yeah. visual, right? Not passion. Wow. Seeing does not produce passion. It produces excitement. Right. And excitement doesn't last a weekend. Amazing. So God said, if you want me, listen, mm -hmm. hear me. You look at me, this relationship will end in a month. That's to all the men out there. <laughs> and the listen. Women who, and the women who buy it. <laughs> so, the, the Kabbalah is the Torah. It's the Kabbalah of the Torah. And it wasn't written down until Reb Shimon Bar Yochai got the courage. So it was transferred orally for ages? Yes. So the other parts of the Torah were translated, trans, transmitted by big groups, big yeshivot, one teacher teaching a hundred students. The Kabbalah was transmitted one to one. Wow. So in a sense, it's better preserved. In a big group, you can, you can misunderstand, you can... But when it's one-on-one, -on -one, carefully chosen, protected... So that's, that's where it is spelled out. Once you hear it, now you look back at the written Torah, and it's right there. It's in the written Torah, but you never noticed it. I feel like I can hear what some people are thinking. And I feel like some people who want to sort of say, well, then, you know, it was just rabbis who said whatever they wanted to say since it was orally transmitted. No human can. And I feel like that I've heard a lot of that. And it wasn't until I went on my own journey of studying Torah with a real um, sort of devoted rabbi for the last 25 years. And simultaneously, everything that I learned for me, because I was raised to with a very rash, rational parents. My parents were very educated and very rational. Everything needed to be proved scientifically. And surprisingly, shockingly, I was able to, I was able to find scientific proof to everything that Torah spoke to. I was able to find whether it was quantum physics or psychology or another science, virtually every single Torah concept that I was taught had proof in quantum physics, science, or psychology. So for me, that is where truth was born, the idea of truth, because I was, I was, you know, I went to UC Berkeley, very liberal, <laughs> you know, everybody's truth is their truth, and there was, I was cracked open to believe, okay, you know, everybody's, everybody has their perception, but it wasn't until I understood and truly realized that when I studied shamanism, Peruvian shamans who live in the Amazon, who never left the Amazon, were saying that the same spiritual concepts were true as what existed in the Torah, that to me, that's truth. That's truth. There's, there's, and that happened with every single Torah concept I came across. So I know my great-grandfather would say that everything in the world that exists comes from Torah. And for a long time, I thought that was just, you know, it's like the Greeks say everything comes <laughs> from Greece and everybody else says everything comes from their culture. But so far in my short life, you know, it's been true. But also this romantic part. The further we go in history, the older our relationship with God becomes. Therefore, God can reveal to the sages things that he did not reveal at Mount Sinai. Mm. So the things that we learn later in history are more personal to God 
And that's why he whispers it to one person, not by thundering it from the top of the mountain. Wow. So we're getting more intimate. We're getting so the the rabbinic, the mitzvot de rabbanan, in some way, are more personal than the ones written in the Torah. Mm -hmm. So it turns everything upside down. We're not fading out. We're getting deeper. Like, for example, if you remember the, the, the Pasuk, at the end of the 40 years in the desert, Moshe says to the people, until today, till today, God did not give you lev, lehovin, eisen, lishmeya, v'ayin, now, 40 years later, you're starting to understand. That's only 40 years. 400 years? 4,000 years? We're making progress. So the customs, the minhag, the, the things that we become careful about that are not written in the Torah that your grandfather never heard about is more important in some way than the things we've always had. So I have a very interesting little example of this. I don't know when it started, but it's pretty recent. If you cut open an onion and leave it overnight, you're not allowed to eat it. People thought it was a superstition. It was some kind of a mystical something or another. It's not written in the Torah. It's not written... You know what the problem is? An onion, you cut it open and leave it overnight, it absorbs viruses. You don't eat it the next day. In fact, if you have a virus or a bad chest cold, cut open an onion, put it near your bed when you're sleeping, and you'll wake up feeling better. Because the virus will be in the onion. Nothing mystical, nothing magical, but ahead of its time. I think the main objective in studying Kabbalah is not to be impressed. To translate it down. Demystify. Don't get mystical. Like you said, it's not like Buddhists sitting on top of a mountain. Stay connected. Yeah. And we find that also in the Torah. Remember, Miriam and, and, and Aaron were, were saying bad things about Moshe, mm -hmm. and Miriam got leprosy? What were they saying? What bad thing were they saying about Moshe? When Moshe came down off the mountain after 40 days and 40 nights, he was not intimate with his wife anymore. And Miriam was saying, who do you think you are? There are a lot of holy people. They're intimate. You're not supposed to be like that. Wow. Come back down to earth. <laughs> You've landed. Wow. Right. <laughs> the eagle has landed. Mm. You're back to earth. Act like a human being. And she was right. Mm. And God agreed with her. In principle, God said, you're right, but Moshe is an exception. Mm. Don't mess with motion. <laughs> wow. Wow.